Audrey, I believe that you were a big Boris Vian admirer long before you made this film. Well, I, I, I had read uh, L'Ecume des Jours when I was a teenager, and I think that as m every teenager, I felt, you know, cleverer by meeting this masterpiece. Mm, so, and that's it, you know. But, I, mean, I, I mean, I know what he did and everything, but, you know, for a French young generation of new readers, this story is uh, very special. Than, you know. and, and what does Boris Vian and his spirit represent? Because he was the kind of the great hipster of post-war Paris. He wrote this novel in 1947. And wh how have you tried to put this kind of spirit into this film? Well, I'd like to correct the fact that he was not a hipster because he never <laughs> met success during his lifetime. So now he would... He, uh, Retrospectively, he has become maybe one, but he didn't meet success, and that's one of the reasons why he tried out many different uh, jobs. So it's sort of ironic that his novel, one of his novels, um, most of his work, became so uh, <coughs> so recognized that it was like 20, 30 years after he passed away. So, what was the question? Well, <laughs> I had forgotten the question. It's, it, it's about his spirit, but I think you, you have distilled a bit of that spirit. I mean, when I think of Boris Vian, one of the things about him was that he was in that world of late 40s jazz clubs, those, those damp yeah, cellars. Yeah, it is true. And he was friends with Jean-Paul Jean Sartre. It's a surrealistic movement also. Yeah. You know. hmm. um, and this was always considered to be an impossible book to film, although it has actually been filmed, I think, twice before. There's a French version, oh, and more right. recently, the Japanese, the Japanese version. version. <coughs> um, so are you, have you seen those versions, and is this film very different? No, I didn't look at them, because when I got the opportunity to direct the movie, I didn't want to... Maybe if it was too good, I would have, it would have depressed me, and it was, <laughs> it was bad, it would have depressed me too. So I avoided to watch them. Maybe I should watch them now. Mm. Uh, Romain, w were you aware of the book? And uh, if so, what I'm did you... I'm a bad example. <laughs> because I, I didn't... So, so uh, when I was a teenager, I, I wasn't fall in love with the book. Because I think... Uh, I, I just read, read the, the, the love story, you know, and I didn't realize all the dark side on the book. So, because of Michel, thank you, man, Welcome. I had the opportunity to, to read this dark side. But uh, what did it feel like when you read the script? Because I can imagine this thing landing on your table and, you know, it's got mice, it's got a something called a pianoc tale. It's got, I can't imagine what it would be like to read it. Yes, but on the first page, it was Michel Gondry. So, <laughs> you know. She didn't read it, in fact. <laughs> Lazy. That yeah. was the reason. That's why you wanted to do it. You accepted to do it. Yeah, but the funny thing is when you read the script and when you read the book, of course, I don't know if you read it, but when you read the script, and you read that they are in the cloud and it come up above the roofs and they do a tour and they, you're like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it's impossible to do that. You know, all the script was totally impossible to make. And also because we knew that he didn't want to do any digital effect because of course everything is possible, but he just wanted to, you know, to have this, his spirit and keep this, very truth of, you know, way of making effect, special effect. This was really something. So I think we were kind of curious to know how we would be able to deal with this crazy, so many crazy ideas and impossible to, you know, to show in a mm. way. I think, I think Michel has the same poetry than Boris Vian, yes. but uh, as a filmmaker and Boris Vian as a writer, you know? So the mix, w when we read the script, the mix, we, we, we thought that, okay, mm. it's going to be interesting. 
And there is something very peculiar about the poetry of this film because what you're doing in your images is you're taking his poetic images from a novel which are almost puns, you know, they're, they're, they're wordplay, pianoctail, but you're making them real. You're putting them into three dimensions and, and taking them literally in a way. Is that, is that part of the fun for you? Yeah, because maybe I was inspired way before I had the project of making this movie by his style um, of making new stuff from recycling uh, other stuff, like making a new world with two existing uh, worlds. And I uh, like to do that with objects. So that was how I could translate it. But there is a funny thing about the cloud that we maybe should talk about. It's like, especially where well, the cloud was really made for real, uh, it was metallic and uh, it was carried by the crane and they went uh, 100 feet above the ground. And it was, uh, <laughs> actually I wanted to try it, uh, to show them it was safe, but uh, it told me I was not allowed by, for insurance <laughs> to take it. They had a special insurance. It was really scary, especially yeah. for Audrey who had vertigo. Oh but God. I think... <laughs> I was like, okay, it's okay. It's okay, Michelle, I think you got your scene. It's okay. You want, it to, you want, it, you want another one? No, I think I have to go down now. But okay. I think... Uh, please, please. I think to me, as a director, their fear of being in this uh, crazy uh, space and experience, uh, they, the fear translated into a fear of a first date. When you meet a girl or a boy uh, the first time and you're really scared that he, he will go wrong and you have so much hope uh, it's going to lead you to happiness. Then you have this fear, and I think it translated not that they will not be capable of acting this fear, but this fear, to me, in my opinion, in my eyes, translated into something that was really connected to the story. You're clever. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> and what is it like acting in a film like this? Because I wonder whether it's like being part of a huge machine, or do you have freedom to... Uh, to move, or do you, do you have freedom to, to kind of improvise or be yourself? <laughs> Should I answer? <laughs> no, but the, uh, well, the thing for this movie, I can't say for the other one, but for this movie, it's so surrealistic, it's so full of ideas that I think that uh, I think that Michel's brain was working like 124 hours to 24 hours, you know. So he was very, he had maybe, I don't know, 1,050, 100 ideas per day. So we were in, in a big, how can I say, like, storm ideas. But he knew exactly, pre precisely what he wanted to do. Mm. So we were, in a way, completely lost, but in another way, very sure that he knew what exactly what he wanted to do and I think that would create something so unusual, no? He knew what I, you were doing. I, huh? Not exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what I know is sometimes actors when you're put in that sort of discomfort mm -hmm. it doesn't really go in the way of the emotion. It sort of managed to make it more real in a way. It's like a just continue on this cloud stuff. It's like when you put actors into the, um, how do you say the mountain Russe? Ah, the mountain Russe. Um, oh, oh um, uh, uh, a roller coaster. Oh, yeah, yeah, roller coaster. Yeah. They, in movies, you have all the, the actor mm. acting and acting, and then they go in the roller coaster and they make those faces. Mm. And they are, you know they are not acting anymore. Mm. They are really yeah. feeling the moment and being scared. So I think I try to do this movie every, every shot of this movie being like that, so the actor could not think of anything but being themselves. You're but clever. that's the truth, huh? because me, before the shooting, <laughs> I was like uh, <laughs> thinking of my part, thinking I'm going to do that, stress this word, and stress this word, and did that, and do that. And you never know when the sh camera is shooting, and you know it's always shooting, and you don't know if it's shooting on, on you or somebody else, so you are like totally lost, so I thought, okay. Well, you know? <laughs> I trust him. We'll see. <laughs> but there was something very different from the other, you know, regular, where when you start to, sh to shoot a scene, 
usually traditionally and every time it's like okay silence okay sound rolling and out uh, with Michel, it would be totally opposite. Like, okay, so let's we shoot, uh, and the cat, no, 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 after, after. <laughs> so we were completely lost, and it was. Uh... I was no, lost too. Was, was it no, hard? No, um, was it hard to decide whether to present this film to people as a kind of mad futuristic vision or as a love story? Um, because the poster, the French poster, for, for example, is is the couple underwater, and it looks like an image from Jean Vigo. Or you know, Chagall or something. But um, the first thing we see in the film is this kind of explosion of this mad world of imagery. Well, I really, I still, despite this chaos that uh, seems random and was maybe random, I try to find a way to focus on, my, focus the attention on the relationship with two, those two guys. That's why I chose them because they had some. Uh, um, I knew they would merge from this chaos, um, but I really was hoping that the love story would come across uh, above the, all the rest. Mm. So I hope I didn't draw them too much into details and, and stuff. And actually, the, all this sort of explosion of details. Really, it's the beginning of the film, and as it, you go along, it becomes more and more about them. Mm. And uh, Audrey and Romain, was it easy to uh, find, you know, an angle on this couple because you've worked together in the uh, Cédric Clapiche trilogy? So did you kind of click into uh, sort of familiar habits? Oh, it was very different, you know, because Cédric Clapiche movies, it's realistic. It's uh, you know, it's it's modern. It's now. I mean. Your thing is modern too. No, don't worry. It's modern. <laughs> but, but there is some poetry, you know, there is so, I don't know for you, but in your eyes, I thought that you, you were looking at me differently like in Clapish movie, you know, because we were, and the tone was difficult to find at the beginning for us because in the book, yes, the characters are very innocent, very light and very young. Yeah, we don't know that much about them. Uh, so the yeah. they do, he, do, he doesn't describe them with their character yeah. or anything. Even physically, you don't really know. So, but the, the language, <laughs> the discussions are very, yeah. very, very light. Yeah. You know, yeah. so we had to find mm. the real tone to be sincere with yeah. that speaking. Mm. Um, can we talk about the period of the film because it seems to belong to no time? I mean, here it's in a science fiction festival. Uh, and it's futuristic, but it starts off in a world that could be 1947, and then you've got the uh, the rebuilding of the Forum Deal, which is has been rebuilt recently. So it's sort of now, but it's sort of 20 years ago as well. Um, does it matter to you when the film is set, or did you want us to think it's never? Yeah, I think it's sort of never. It's like it's a. Uh it's a parallel time that started when the book was written. It's like the time went to a different branch. And it's now, but with another uh, possibility of time. But I didn't want to cut the real Paris outside of the thing because he would mean that I had to construct, we had, we'd have to construct every single object. And then I wanted, when they go out, I wanted to feel the energy of Paris. So we combine elements from a little bit of different time. We reconstructed cars and from cars from the past and cars from now and tried to create a world that was still, uh, that could integrate the reality of, of the world now. Um, you've kind of made a, a sort of romantic trilogy now, I think, with um, Eternal Sunshine, the Science of Sleep, um, and this film. I mean, those three films seem to go together very well. Yeah, well, maybe it's because it's what's going on in, in people's head, you know, about the feelings and stuff like that. And uh, it's uh, sort of surrounded by other bits that are going in your head and that are more difficult to identify, but they're still there. And, and the other thing that struck me as a parallel with Eternal Sunshine, you seem to like people jumping up and down on beds. Yeah, they do that here too. No. 
It's a good definition of acting, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>